Last time, we had the final batch of Star Wars novels to come out contemporaneously with the films. This time, we're taking a look at the last batch of Star Wars comics to come out with the films. In this case, the books that Marvel came out with after the release of Return of the Jedi. From what I've been able to determine after the release of Return of the Jedi, as far as people in the positions of authority at various publishers and licensing companies were concerned, everyone was done with Star Wars. Nobody wanted any more Star Wars. The story was over. Everyone would just move on to something else. There would still be action figures once the current license had expired. But that's it. And that applied to Marvel's pretty much as anyone else. No one wanted more Star Wars books. Nobody wanted to do more Star Wars comics. And... That leads to the problem with Marvel, because that is reflected in the title. The book is no doubt still selling, and Marvel has certainly seen the benefits of keeping one creative team on a single title for a long run, with Claremont at this point now writing X-Men, and Bill Mantelow and Sal Buscema writing and drawing, doing art for Rom Space Knight. So, at this point, we see Mary, we see Anne Duffy remain on the book for the remainder of the run. And we see a few artists come in and out on the art side, though. In particular, we get Bill Sienkiewicz on covers for quite a while, and pencils in the book done quite often by Cynthia Martin, among others. But there's a lot of turnover in the art department. With the death of the Empire and the destruction of Imperial forces that we see in Return of the Jedi, Marvel Star Wars is now in an interesting position in terms of having to form an entirely new status quo. The Rebel Alliance now faces the new challenge of having to form an actual functioning government after having defeated the Emperor, while also fending off various Imperial splinter groups and trying to get new worlds to sign on to the Alliance. This leads to the story being divided into two major chunks. The first arc focuses on the Alliance as they contend with the remnants of the Galactic Empire and a new threat in the form of Lumaya, Dark Lady of the Sith. This chunk is fairly episodic. The second arc, which begins on issue 100, features the introduction of a new group of alien invaders, the Nagai. The Nagai have come from somewhere outside of the Outer Rim, and have the potential to become an even more dangerous opponent than the Empire. Or rather, they become more dangerous until the introduction of the Tofs, the alien race which held the Nagai as slaves, and which the Nagai were fleeing from. At which point the conflict becomes something of a three-way war. The series wraps up with issue 107, which features an incredibly sudden time skip to the end of the war, with some of the Nagai and the Rebel Alliance joining forces to defeat the Toffs and the Imperial Remnant. The issue makes it clear that there's a lot of story in between the last two issues, and I wonder if Ann Duffy had considerably more plot laid out, but Marvel's decision not to renew the license left her in the lurch. Issue 86, which features Leia and an Imperial Stormtrooper from Alderaan in an enemy mind sort of situation, ends up providing a bunch of posthumous world-building for Alderaan. Whether the truth of the destruction of Alderaan was kept from the general populace, we learned that the rank and file of the Imperial military knew. 
Also, in the comics at least, Alderaan was a traditional monarchy, as opposed to the sort of hybrid constitutional monarchy that we'd see in the form of Naboo in the prequel era. Also, in issue 92, we learned that the ability for Jedi to live on to the Force is not a secret technique, and the ability of Force ghosts to contact the living is not limited to those they knew in life. As the spirit of Yoda is able to speak with Princess Villa and Prince Denon in issue in that issue. Moving back a little bit, in issue 87, we have another ancient race building a doomsday weapon of incredible power. In this case, one built by the Shokan with the power to destroy the galaxy. Why so powerful? Well, because it was designed by a nihilist. No, I'm not kidding. While the Zeltron were introduced in the last segment of the series, we get an actual look at their society here as opposed to just seeing them wandering around the galaxy. There are a race that appear to have an incredibly pronounced, well, sex drive, both for men and women, but it's also established that part of their thing is they feel emotions incredibly strongly, and they built their society around managing those impulses but not repressing them. We're also introduced to the Hiromi, a race of cockroach aliens that were initially part of the Rebel Alliance, but later try to go off on their own and take over the Alliance and the entire galaxy, although they're about as competent as Wily e. Coyote. Or maybe Zim. However, the most significant race of aliens we're introduced to in this chunk are the Nagai. They are a race of thin, pale-skinned humanoids who culturally favor knives as weapons, and can have something of a sadistic streak. They're from another galaxy, and partly through their storyline, we're discovered that they're a slave race fleeing their enslavers, the Toffs. The Toffs themselves are a race of yellow-skinned humanoids with long hair, and which are very muscular. Unfortunately, we're introduced to them so late in the series' run that we don't actually get an opportunity to really get into their society. On the technology front, we have Lumaya's Light Whip. It has a variety of heads, some metal, some hide, and some energy, and it can lash and entangle an opponent or their weapon. It appears to be incredibly difficult to use, but Lumaya, having been well-trained in it and also being, having the Force as her ally, being a Sith, is quite efficient at using the weapon. Also, on an economic side of things, playing off of the mining guild that Lando mentioned in Empire, we learn that there is also a metallurgist guild, which the Alliance needs to curry favor with in order to have the materials to build their warships. Luke did not tell his friends about being Vader's son right away. He is also reluctant to teach other students for beer, fear of being responsible for causing them to turn to the dark side as his father did. He eventually decides to teach Kiro the ways of the Force, though Kiro ends up abandoning his training for reasons we'll get into a little later. And Luke ends, also ends up developing a two-weapon lightsaber fighting style similar to Miyamoto Musashi's. Over the time skip, he grows his hair out and starts wearing a Rambo-esque headband. Princess Leia becomes part of the Alliance's inner circle as it attempts to transition from the Rebel Alliance into a new republic, tentatively called the Alliance of Free Planets. After the events of issue 103, she discovers there are dissatisfied factions within the Nagai and works to form an alliance with those factions to help defeat the other Nagai and the Toffs. Han feels a little dissatisfied with staying in one place after defeating the Empire, but he also wants to stay with Leia. Han has come to hate the snow due to his experiences on Hoth, and we also learn that Han had a foster brother on the streets of Corellia, Bay, who we later learn is half the guy. In issue 91, we have a visit, visit to Kashyyyk. There, Chewbacca is reunited with his wife and kid, and the A-plot of the Star Wars Holiday Special becomes canon. Lando manages to mend fences with Treble by giving him the statue that everyone was chasing after in that story where Lando dressed up as Captain Harlock. Also, continuing with the Lando is a secret otaku thread, Lando has his own ship called the Cobra, as in Space Adventure Cobra. We learn that R2 has a hard point for a blaster. Darth Vader, we learn, has had basically two secret apprentices. Flint, who was introduced in the third annual, and Lamaya. Flint, I should mention, looks a bit like Ben Solo or Kylo Ren. 
Mon Mothma does some field diplomatic missions, one of which leads to her being captured by Lumaya's troops, and she helps fight back after being freed. However, she ends up shutting Han, Luke, Lando, and, to a degree, Leia, out of the inner circles of Alliance government after they miss an important meeting. For some other goddamn reason, she also grounds Han and Luke after they fail or miss a written flight exam. Admiral Akbar is also involved in this piece of bureaucratic dickery. Vett survives his initial fall into the Sarlacc and escapes, only to end up back in the Sarlacc after being rescued by Jawas, who think he's a droid, and ending up on their sandcrawler when it goes crashing into the Sarlacc. Presumably the Sarlacc is killed by this. Or it's much, much more rigorous and can endure more punishment than we think. Lumaya, Dark Lady of the Sith, is introduced in this portion of the series. We previously knew the character as Imperial Double Agent Lieutenant Sharia Bree. She was believed killed in action by Luke, but it was later revealed that she was actually framing him for a friendly fire incident. However, during her recovery, she develops a personal vendetta against Luke for her injuries. Lumaya becomes leader of the Imperial Remnant before joining forces with the Nagai and then the Toffs, basically shifting her allegiances to stay with whatever side Luke isn't on. Danny is the main Zeltran character we've seen over the course of the series. She was introduced in the last chunk, but only as a guest character who we see off and on, but not for any real long durations of time, and we see her fall for Luke. Here, she gets over Luke and falls for Kiro, one of the aquatic people of planet Iskalon. However, she has her heart broken after she is tortured by the guy, and Kiro is presumed killed at their hands while trying to rescue her. From there, she is utterly consumed by hate for the Nagai until... At some point in the time skip, she is talked down by Leia. Now for Kiro, as with Danny, he's a brief character from the last chunk of the series who formed a close bond with Luke, and he's a bigger recurring appearance in this part. As mentioned earlier, Kiro wants Luke to train him in the ways of the Force, and it's implied that he's Force-sensitive due to his ability to think independently of the school, which is the center of Iskalon society, being that they're a water-breathing aquatic people. Kiro and Danny fall for each other, but not long after our heroes make first contact with the Nagai, Kiro is presumed killed. Later, Luke and Lando return to Iskalon and discover Kiro is in fact alive, and he has survived, escaped, and returned to his homeworld to fight off the Nagai threat. Kiro chooses to remain on Iskalon to fight off the Nagai, forsaking continuation of his training. That said, at this point he is so consumed by hate of the Nagai that there is a reasonable possibility that had he been further trained, he might have turned to the dark side. The last issue includes thanks to a lot of Japanese readers and fans, which makes me suspect that the series had a very significant fan following in Japan. I can't find any information on Wikipedia about a Japanese edition, though. With the episode on Kashyyyk, I wonder if Joe Duffy watched the holiday special, or if she managed to get a list of important story notes from the special and was thus able to avoid actually watching it, dodging that blaster bolt. There are some real standout stories here, and some real duds. Issue 89, which is a clear fill-in story, is frankly really bad. It completely ignores internal continuity on the series, which is glaring considering that the writer of this issue, Anne Nesenti, is also the editor of this series at this point. In particular, Luke is acting very out of character here. He acts and almost looks like Luke from Just After A New Hope, where he was young, brash, and impulsive, not the more mature Luke from After Return of the Jedi, which is when this issue was set. I know Nesenti can write better and with Louise Simonson, who had previously edited Star Wars guest editing, I know that it should be better. I don't know what happened here. It feels like a planned issue was delayed for some reason or another, and rather than miss a month, Nocinti threw something together, um, basically on her own, and grabbed it, Louise Simonson to co-edit the issue to, make, to handle that part of things. The core plot beat of this issue that a character who was believed to be murdered actually committed suicide, but there is not enough time in the issue for that to have happened off-panel as things are laid out. 
Huh? How could they miss each other? Space is warped and time is bendable. Otherwise, the final version uh, portion of... Ah, start over. New cut. Otherwise, the final portion of Marvel Star Wars looks like it's going to bring a lot of plot threads from the interfilm period together, and it basically succeeds. The primary place where it stumbles is because the end of the series is so rushed. I would really like to know if the initial plotting of the series was working from the perspective that Marvel was going to renew the license, and then, when they didn't, the writer had to shove everything into the last issue. It's interesting to note that... The, that ah. It's interesting to note that the Nogai Toth Alliance War is generally ignored in the Legends canon, with the distinct exception of Amaya. From an RPG standpoint, because the war is essentially covered in the time skip, it's incredibly gameable. That said, nobody has really covered this period in terms of gaming materials in any depth. Not West End Games, not Wizards of the Coast, and because Fantasy Flight Games has set their stuff during the Dark Times period, pre A New Hope or kind of in that vicinity, not Fantasy Flight Games either. The closest we got to material related to this was a web adventure from Wizards of the Coast for their D20-based Star Wars role-playing game, where the players are given a mission by Luke to find Danny and let her know that Kiro was still alive. I'd be interested in reading that, but that's an adventure that would have primarily have emotional impact if your players were familiar with Marvel's run of the comics, and in particular the tail end of the series. Next time, we'll do something a little different and give an overview of the dark times between the end of Marvel Star Wars and the publication of Heir to the Empire. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time.